Hello and welcome. My name is John Robinson uh, and I'm an assistant professor of, of sociology uh, here at WashU and my work examines racial and economic inequality in the areas of housing and credit. Uh, and I also sit on the board of an organization that we'll hear more about today, uh, the Arch City Defenders. Uh, and it's on behalf of the Wash U Alumni Association and uh, the Black Alumni Council that uh, I'm really excited to welcome you to our event today, Transforming St. Louis, a conversation with two dynamic people, Kayla Reed and Blake Strode. Uh, and so before we begin, I just want to explain a little uh, about the format for today's session. Uh, you will hear only, uh, you will hear and see only me and the panelists today. Uh, uh, and the webinar will last for about one hour. Um, following the conversation, we will have uh, time for questions. Uh, and we encourage you to participate uh, by asking questions at any time by typing in that little Q&A box. Um, and we thank you all who have already uh, submitted questions uh, through, the through the registration um, uh, protocol. Um, and uh, during the Q&A session, we'll, we're gonna get to as many as of those questions as we can. Um, so just an FYI, the webinar is being recorded uh, and we will share it on the Alumni Association YouTube channel uh, and on the website following the events. Uh, so I'm, I'm about to um, uh, introduce our panelists, but I wanted to just first mention uh, recently, I was reminded of a saying. Um, it's often attributed to uh, an ancient Chinese proverb, but in truth, we don't really know where this saying comes from. Uh, but it's worth considering anyway. Uh, the saying is, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and it sounds harmless enough, but as some of you know, it's actually not a way of wishing someone well. It's actually a curse, uh, quite the opposite, right? And uh, I wouldn't have understood why 10, uh, 15 years ago, but I certainly understand today, uh, because I, as I'm sure you'll agree, we've been living for some time now, uh, and especially from last into this year, in interesting times. Uh, that is, times that are not boringly pleasant, uh, but, but a time of what often feels like crisis, of what feels like chaos and upheaval. Uh, but interesting times are also times of possibility. Uh, and there are times when the wheels of change and transformation are turning. Uh, and that's when we really look for voices that boldly stand out, voices that provide clarity, uh, voices that inspire us, not only to dream, uh, but also to fight. Uh, and it's my great pleasure today uh, to introduce two such voices, uh, voices for, from our very own uh, St. Louis. Uh, and these are two voices for our interesting times. Um, as our panelists this evening. Uh, and uh, on a panel called Transforming St. Louis, I don't know that there are two better voices that we can hear from on the important issues facing our city and nation. And so I'm very thrilled um, uh, and honored to be joined today in conversation with Kayla Reed and Blake Strode. Uh, Kayla is a graduate of Wash U. Uh, and selfishly, I want to add here that Kayla is also a graduate specifically of our sociology program. We're very proud about that. But more importantly, uh, Kayla is the co-founder and director of Action St. Louis, uh, and also a lead strategist in the Movement for Black Lives, where she co-founded the Electoral Justice Project, which is a national campaign. We'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that, uh, the, these organizations today. Uh, we, we also have with us Blake Strode. Uh, Blake is the executive director of Arch City Defenders, another organization that we'll hear about today. He is a native of the St. Louis region, uh, having joined Arch City as a Skadden Fellow and as a staff attorney following his graduation from Harvard Law School in 2015. Blake has accomplished so much in this position that it's hard for me to even to believe that he's been there for five years. So I, I want to thank you both, Kayla and Blake, uh, for sharing a conversation uh, with, with, with us today. Um, and so I just want to move into the, the discussion. Um, and I was hoping we can sort of begin today's discussion by, uh, I just want to ask you guys to introduce your work, uh, the work that you do, and to share a little bit about your organization's work in St. Louis. Uh, and, and, and Kayla, uh, how about we start with you? I knew that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, so good evening, everyone. And thank you all so much for um, joining us this evening uh, and, and letting us know who you are when you graduated or, you know, have someone who goes to watch you um, and where you're calling, where you're coming in from. So again, my name is Kayla Reed. I use the she series for pronouns and um as stated, I am the co-founder and executive director of Action St. Louis. Um, I am native to St. Louis. I was born here. I uh, have lived here all of my soon to be 31 years on, uh, on this earth. Uh, and I love this city dearly. 
um, and, and deeply. Uh, I grew up in North City, St. Louis um, and, and ended up graduating from Riverview Gardens. Um, and in 2014, I was a pharmacy technician um, after you know going to school for a little while and needing to work. Uh, and Mike Brown was killed on August 9, 2014. And that really was this pivotal moment um, in my life where, you know, when you think about certain dates that transform the trajectory of everything in your life, um, that date is one of them for me. Uh, and I became a protester because I understood um, Mike Brown's life, similar, you know, to my own, um, going to one of the uh, most underfunded disinvested school districts where Mike Brown was killed as a part of the school district I graduated from. Um, and, and also understanding the encounter that Mike Brown had the day he lost his life um, as a normalcy in St. Louis County. And Johnny may be best to mute because I think it's echoing. Um, and um, yeah, so understanding that relationship to police but not understanding the deadly encounter and then certainly not understanding beyond that, the devastating um, disrespect um, of his body laying on the ground for four and a half hours. And so um, my work kind of began, my work in movement, if you will, began at that moment. And I was um, fortunate enough to become an organizer in December of 2014 uh, at the Organization for Black Struggle. And I worked there for two years on issues of um, voting rights, municipal elections, helping to get the first, um, the second, third, and fourth Black folks to ever exist, to ever seat on the uh, Ferguson City Council elected, to get the Civilian Oversight Board passed in St. Louis City, um, and to get, to help get the first Black woman prosecutor elected in St. Louis City in 2016. And when I left OBS, I was leaving because I was coming to be a student at Washington University to finish my bachelor's degree. Um, but couldn't quite shake the organizing bug. And so um, Action St. Louis is an outgrowth of a coalition known as St. Louis Action Council that was started during the Ferguson uprising as sort of a direct action uh, strategy space. Um, and what Action St. Louis has evolved into in the last five years is an organization that is trying to figure out the question of how do we build power for black people in St. Louis what is the theory of change that is necessary to do that? What are the campaigns uh, that we need to launch to move us closer to that? And what I mean by power is the ability to both set and impact agendas and determine um, outcomes for our communities. Uh, and so we've spent the last five years doing that in three key issues, um, which we'll talk more about, I'm sure. But we are an abolitionist organization, so our campaigns are anti-carceral focused. Um, we work a lot with our city defenders, which I know we'll talk about, on ways to divest resources out of the carceral system, which includes everything from police to jails to prosecution. We work on housing issues also with Arch City, um, which, which this year include mitigating the harm of the economic fallout from COVID-19 and the um, astronomical number of evictions that are pending and moving and people are getting this kind of 30 day relief at a time with the extension of the moratorium. And then finally, um, what we call electoral justice and democracy expansion, um, which is all about um, getting folks to understand the power in voting and the structural um, components of our democracy and moving toward um, folks using that as a tool toward building power and holding um, institutions accountable for the conditions in our communities. Uh, and I'm excited to talk more again. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Um, well, first, first and foremost, um, I wanna thank you all for letting me crash this Wash U party. Uh, I'm not a Wash U alum, but they let me come anyway. <laughs> uh, and I'm so happy and excited to be here. Um, both, both Kayla and, and John are two of my very favorite people and most respected people in St. Louis um, also happen to be Arch City board members. We have the best board. I got that. Uh, I, was like, I, I know. Mm, yeah. I'm also on the board. <laughs> Arch City Defenders. Yes. As long as action has existed. So yes. That's right. This is, this is a family conversation. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, so I am also, as John said, a St. Louis native. I grew up um, mostly in St. Louis County in North St. Louis County, graduated from Pattonville High School um, in 2005 and was away from the region 
um, between undergrad and some years playing tennis and then going to law school was away for about 10 years before I returned in 2015. Um, and in a very different kind of way, August 9th, 2014 was also um, really a, a formative moment in my life as well. Um, I was headed back to my third year of law school when Michael Brown was shot and killed by Darren Wilson. And um, it, it changed what I understood to be um, meaningful and critical work as someone who was thinking about what to do with these new skills, what to do with this new credential, this law degree. Um, it made me really think about this region, think about my hometown um, and communities like Ferguson that were just minutes from where I had grown up, where I'd spent um, large chunks of my childhood, where I had many deep relationships. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to return to St. Louis in 2015, as John mentioned, on, on a Skadden Fellowship, which is a public interest um, fellowship, funds civil legal services work all over the country. Um, and I started doing work really uh, combating the kind of debtor's prison phenomena that we saw in places like Ferguson, have seen, continue to see in, in various forms in cities and towns like Ferguson all throughout the region um, and indeed across the state. And so I, I joined an organization that was still very much evolving and in transition. Um, and now we are a place, it's, it's almost hard for me to sometimes describe the full breadth of our work because it continues to evolve and grow, but we are fundamentally a place that is committed to combating the criminalization of poverty and state violence, uh, particularly against poor people and black people in St. Louis. And so that, that Ferguson moment, that moment of uprising, um, as well as being personally formative for me was very much formative for Arch City Defenders. Uh, and we do our work, we, we think about the main issue areas that we work in as being um, criminal justice, though we don't usually use that term. We, we describe it as the criminal legal system, uh, housing and homelessness, and homelessness really sitting at the intersection of um, housing insecurity and the uh, criminalization by the state that occurs for people that are surviving on the streets. And we do that work um, primarily through four ways, through holistic direct representation. So um, legal representation across various uh, legal issues, as well as wraparound social service supports for our client. We recently added full-time social work staff, which we're really excited about and helps us to deepen that holistic work. Uh, the second is systemic civil rights litigation, which is really where I got my start at Arch City Defenders, bringing lawsuits to attack the policies and systems and practices that criminalize and oppress our clients. The third is policy and media advocacy. So that's a combination of sort of storytelling, digital media engagement, um, and translating that into policy demands that, that support our clients and their communities. And then lastly is what we call community collaborations, which really captures um, a lot of the work Kayla was referencing, a lot of the work we do with Action St. Louis on campaigns and um, policy projects and um, really building power at the grassroots level and, and trying our best to shift consciousness around these issues um, so, that, so that we can um, expand the window of what is possible in terms of, of policy solutions and grassroots solutions to the problems we face. So that's a little bit about Arch City Defenders. Thank you both, uh, Kayla and Blake, uh, because, you know, I know personally how much both of these organizations, um, you know, how much uh, these organizations take on. So your summary of what these organizations do in such a small amount of time is very, uh, is uh, very impressive. But, you know, what really touched me uh, in both of your stories is about how you talked about these tragic moments, um, these these moments that you experienced, these moments that that you witnessed, um, and how the story of your work in these organizations is also a story of better understanding those moments, where those moments came from, and what became of those moments. Um, and, and so, and so, I, I just wanted to just sort of acknowledge that in your stories, and you know, I think that's a a really um, helpful thing for us all to think about here. Um, you know, those moments to step outside of those moments to really ask some questions about what those moments mean to us. What does what do, what do those moments look, look like in your own lives? And what become of those moments? For both of you, something became of those moments. Um, and Kayla, you talked about city government. Um, uh, Blake, you talked about the court systems and lots of other things. So um, I, I really appreciate your focus on power, which I think we will uh, talk about more. 
Um, and another thing that became of those moments, Blake, you talked about is thinking about what am I going to do with these credentials? It's a very personal question that I think uh, became of that. So I just want to encourage the people in the audience to, uh, to uh, think more about that. Um, thank you. And we, I want to move now into some of the more specifics of what you do. So I know one of the overlapping areas um, that both of you are involved with often together um, is the area of the in, um, in sort of uh, uh, handling the injustices within law enforcement. And so I want to ask you more about that specifically. Uh, one campaign that deserves special mention here is the Close the Workhouse uh, campaign, which many of us know about, uh, the local gra grassroots effort against the inhumane living conditions uh, in, the, in the workhouse that has received a lot of national attention. My favorite piece of this is Ben and Jerry's sent their scoop trucks uh, to, to one of the events. Um, and I wasn't there to get uh, ice cream, unfortunately, but uh, it, I think it speaks to the reach of this campaign. It speaks to um, the way this campaign has become a real pressure point in the fight for racial justice. So I want to ask you um, both to sort of speak to that. Um, Kayla, can you give us sort of a high level um, overview of that campaign and sort of how it started and, and, uh, and, and, and where it is today and, so, and what were some of the challenges around that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, I, yeah, so the campaign really gets its kind of origin from a 20, a 2017, yeah, 2017 effort um, that came out of the Movement for Black Lives. So the Movement for Black Lives um, is an ecosystem of organizations that I have um, been in leadership of for most of, yeah, most of its existence since the Ferguson uprising as well. And uh, in 2017, they launched an initiative called the Black Mamas Day Bailout. Uh, and the kind of, um, you know, thinking behind it was that when many people talked about the the consequences of this, you know, criminal legal system and the impacts of mass incarceration, we often hear kind of a set of statistics, right, that one in three Black men will be incarcerated in their lifetime and that um, Black people are overrepresented, overrepresented in um, prison, jail, all, all forms of the criminal legal system. And what often gets lost is that Black women were the is um, was a growing demographic, right? The fastest growing demographic within mass, the mass incarceration kind of the statistics that we look at when we're making those conclusions. And so, and pretrial detention was also one of these like facets, right? That we often talk about the prison population, but there are about a million people every single day in this country who are impacted through the pretrial detention system. Um, and are caged in local jails, right? And are mostly caged because they are poor and unable to pay bail. And so what would it look like for a community to come together and essentially provide mutual aid to free our own um, community members who are in these cages? Uh, and St. Louis, um, being a part of that ecosystem uh, at the time, you know, had a, we, I was in school. <laughs> I was in finals actually. And we had uh, just had, you know, we were kind of texting about it. Like, this is an amazing opportunity. We should do this here in St. Louis for Mother's Day and um, put out a community fundraiser and raised about $13,000 in three days. And we're able to bail out about um, almost 15 women from local jails. Um, and so, you know, got those out in our city being a holistic organization was able to assist further than just the immediate release, but helping to kind of stabilize folks, whether or not that's groceries, helping to find long term housing, any kind of um, uh, any of the things that people lose when they're in that pretrial system, housing, jobs, employment, custody of their children, you know, Arch City kind of stepped in to provide that support. And then in June of that same year, um, a typical St. Louis heat, uh, we started to hear about folks protesting inside of the workhouse for lack of air conditioning, that they were only getting water once an hour, and they were literally screaming outside of the um, of the jail and the workhouse, uh, properly known as the Medium Security Institute, is on Hall Street. So it's it's zoned industrial. So that many people don't drive past it. It's, it's mostly a commuter street to get you from the city to North County, um, in you know kind of the straightest line. Uh, but it got picked up by the news, and so we decided again to ask the community for resources. And this time they gave us about um, they gave us about. $15,000 again, but then we were able to also tap into the movement for Black Lives for some resources um, to bail out more folks. And when we put up a request, um, I remember putting up a status on Facebook saying, hey, if you have someone who's in the workhouse, please send me an email. And I put up my personal email account. And in a day, 
uh, by the time I woke up the next morning, we had over a hundred people who had emailed me saying that they had loved ones who were diabetic and hadn't gotten insulin in days who, you know, um, had, you know, wounds that were infected and had to see a nurse all month. And, you know, just the, 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 off, the that that was being compounded by the heat um, and that they were being, you know, um, like the response was just aggression and, and more violence. And so we were able to not bail out everyone, but bail out another group of folks. And the demand come, came out of those folks who we bailed out that they said, thank you for bailing us out, but you need to close that jail. Uh, and people literally were saying, I've been to prison and this jail is worse than the state penitentiary I was in. Uh, and so we asked the question as organizers, what does it look like to reimagine public safety that it is not just these systems pre child detention, you know, and mass incarceration, but it is also the facilities that give permission to um, the ways that our folks are mistreated in this system. Um, and we launched a campaign to close the workhouse. And in fall of 20, it took us about like in the fall of 2018, yeah. we launched it. Yeah. Um, and it's three organizations that have kind of anchored the different components of this campaign, the Bell Project St. Louis, which is um, an effort to, they pay bail for folks who are um, incarcerated in our city. Um, our city defenders, which has, they've done everything from, you know, organizing now to lawsuits that I'm sure Blake will talk about. And Action St. Louis really kind of anchored this idea of what does it look like to do some of the traditional organizing to popularize the idea, to do public education on an idea, to develop leaders who are directly impacted around these issues, uh, and then to look at our elected leadership to take positions on these issues toward getting this jail closed. Um, and we've been doing that since 2018. And we had, um, we've had great partnerships, uh, including Ben and Jerry's and the free ice cream that people often associate with. <laughs> you know, um, if we can get you with ice cream, we'll take you, you know, if, if that's what brings you into. We hope that ice cream brings you through the door, but the, the kind of moral component of the campaign keeps you there. And so really this idea that when we first said close the workhouse was foreign to people, they were like, y'all are crazy. This isn't gonna happen. This is ridiculous. It is. It has grown to be the largest campaign, like issue-based campaign in our region in a very long time. Um, and it resulted, uh, kind of culminated in 2020 with the passage of an ordinance bill that was supposed to close the jail by the end of 2020. Um, and we're hoping that that will take place in 2021 and are organizing to make that a reality. Thank you, Kayla. And, you know, and let me just say one of the things that I'm struck by is how the, this effort sort of began as this kind of heroic effort to, to really um, fill in the gaps for, for, for people, you know, people who were being discarded by this system and how that led you. But I think it's, it's, it's really important to note that that led uh, you and others to a place of there's nothing good that could come out of this. Let's close the facility down. Um, and I think that's an important moment to, to, to arrive at. And so, and so I want to kind of just note that. Um, Blake, I, I know that you, um, we're also uh, really deeply involved in, 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 uh, uh, in this, again, heroic effort uh, around the, uh, around the uh, workhouse. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to ask you in the interest of time about also another project, another project that um, has recently been launched by uh, the Arch City uh, Defenders, um, that project being the, um, the Fatal State Violence mm -hmm. Project. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the importance of this project and kind of speaks to and speak to how it connects to the moment that we're in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think this connects to the um, earlier question about sort of how we think about law enforcement. And, um, you know, I, my, my own sort of evolving thinking on law enforcement has come from seeing people actually um, subjected to the realities of quote unquote law enforcement here. Our clients, the folks we work with, the folks we're organizing with in partnership with. Um, when you see someone, I've, one of my very first clients at Arch City was a woman who um, had been held in jail, nearly lost her job, um, had to scrape up money she didn't have because her trash lid wasn't properly secured to a trash can. And that was in the name of law enforcement. And when we look today at issues like George Floyd being really lynched live on camera with a knee in his neck or Breonna Taylor executed by SWAT, there's a direct line between the kind of 
poverty crime and that fatal, what we call fatal state violence. It is that we have unaccountable systems of policing and quote unquote law enforcement that are targeted at poor people, targeted at black people and have been for as long as these systems have existed. And so the Fatal State Violence Project really is an attempt to do a couple of things. One is to um, accurately present a picture of what um, state killings look like, how many there are, how widespread they are, um, where they happen, who the victims of these um, killings are. And we've, we've primarily focused on police killings, but also included people that have lost, lost their lives in um, local jails in the region. And over a course of, of 10 years, we were able to document 179. And we know that we didn't capture everything. We captured everything we could through public records requests, looking at police reports, media documentation, um, but documented 179 people who lost their lives through state violence. And um, importantly, the, the second piece really is exploring what that means for the surviving families, for the loved ones who have lost someone to a police killing and can't get any answers about what happened, can't get any support to bury their loved one, can't um, get any kind of accountability for the person that, that took a life. And this is such a widespread problem in the St. Louis region. The St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department um, has the highest rate of killings per capita of any major metropolitan police department in the country. We also have the highest police per capita ratio in the country. And so you see, you know, we've had these, these flashpoints in recent years, um, Michael Brown, Anthony Lamar Smith, Kajin Powell, um, Von Derek Myers, all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, high profile cases. Um, and there's so, so many more that we don't think about regularly, don't talk about, but there are literally hundreds, thousands of people walking around their lives forever changed because they have lost someone to this, um, to this issue that, that just continues day in, day out with so little accountability. And so the Fatal State Violence Project that we launched uh, last month on Martin Luther King Day was really an attempt to highlight and spotlight this, um, this scourge and to, to bring about um, some real energy towards accountability, towards support for the families, and, and to um, materially shift resources in a way that this doesn't happen to people in the future. Thank you, Blake. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, really came to mind for me um, uh, in, in your account of this is in thinking about the inhumanity of policing um, to today and how a lot of that inhumanity is sort of justified and maintained by, as you say, sort of the, the myths and the fictions of, what, of, 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 of law enforcement today. And so we may have this idea of what activist work is, but it's really interesting um, that you, um, how this report, the Fatal State Violence Report, as you, um, as you explain it, it really illustrates how a part of activism is really demystifying the realities of what's actually really happening to people to really unearth their, their humanity. Um, uh, yeah it's a really critical part of that and so and so I thank you for that um, for that I think that gives us a lot of uh, a lot to think about um, and so so I thank you and Kayla for that I, I want to ask you um, in our um, about 10 minutes before uh, Q&A um, uh, I wanted to just jump um, we'll we'll have some time I think to, uh, to discuss housing issues in the Q&A um, but I did want to ask you both and and I'll throw this um, out to you both um, about to sort of zoom out for a moment. Uh, we've talked about law enforcement. We'll talk more specifically about housing and other things in, in, in a Q&A. But if you can zoom out for a moment to, to, to tell me um, about the larger theory of change behind your, your, your organization. Um, both of you mentioned power. Both of you mentioned, uh, you both use this term expand. Kayla, you talked about democratic expansion. Um, uh, Blake, I, I don't remember the exact term that you used, but you also used the term expand. And so I wanted to just, if you guys could just speak to um, the way in which your organizations um, pursues a kind of activist vision that really focuses on reshaping uh, and transforming structures of power. Um, and 
uh, first, is that, a, is, is that fair to say? And if that's fair to say, um, what does that look like on the ground? How do you carry that out on the ground? Uh, can can uh, you guys speak to that? Yeah, you know, we, you know, shameless plug, we, Blake and I uh, co-host a podcast where uh, called Under the Arts, where we often talk about a lot of these issues. And so if you don't, you know, get enough here, you should totally go listen to some of the, se- two of the seasons that we finished, a third one to come at some point. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, what, what I will say about power is that um, Action St. Louis is, explicitly committed to this idea of building po- political power for black people. And the, the truth is in a lot of places like St. Louis, right? Whether you're talking about the North side of St. Louis, the South side of Chicago, you know, West side of, Memphis, you know like these kind of places where black people have migrated to from the South over the last century, you will see a lot of um, that they are, that we are, that our families have been impacted by a lot of decisions by folks who have led institutions and led and been in power, right? And so even when we think about housing in St. Louis, why North City looks drastically dis- different than South City is because, you know, policy makers, people in power have made decisions, right? And so our communities have been on the receiving end of those decisions and have had to play kind of, re- have had to respond to them and defend our communities from those attacks. Uh, and so when we think about power, we think about the ability to set agendas, right? That, that Black people get to envision and think through what does a community that thrives look like from my perspective, right? And, and have the ability to set that into motion. Uh, and the reason that we have thought about voting as one of those particular uh, ideas or, you know, and more broadly, the why we classify ourselves as a racial justice organization is because race is one of the ways in which this country is organized across institutions. There are racial outcomes in every institution, whether we're talking about the cr- criminal legal system, Black people were disproportionately impacted. We're talking about housing. Black people are less likely to own homes, more likely to pay higher interest rates, more likely to be denied a loan, more likely to be evicted. If we're talking about voting, Black people are most likely to be disenfranchised most likely to have, you know, less funding coming to our communities for voting um, and most likely to be purged in in cases that we've seen across the country, whether or not it's Georgia um, or what we just saw in 2020 or Florida with the felon restoration rights that passed a couple years ago. So race is one of the ways in which our society is organized. And, And the way that we think about power is the ability to reduce the disparate outcomes that we know that these institutions perpetuate over time. And so for action, what we have thought about is how do we build the power necessary that's around education, right? And so we do a lot of not public educate, like political education, right? That we want to demystify the how we got here. That is not happenstance, that is not because of any individual actor, that this is a structural and systemic cause um, that created these conditions. And there's a structural and systemic response that we can facilitate to change it. Um, and then that there, that these are policies, right? And policies are made by people that we elect. And so if we engage in that system, we can change policymakers and write better policy that actually, um, you know, responds to some of the harm and lessens the likelihood of more harm to come. Uh, and so power is at the at the kind of nexus is, is is really something that action thinks a lot about in relationship to our city, which is why I think our orgs are so complementary because we also think about tactics to leverage that power, right? And so the legal world and and Blake's law degree is very helpful for an organizer like me um, to to say if we're in the streets, we're protesting and we get arrested, we have a lawyer to say if we need to sue because people, if we need to sunshine request or or sue or, you know, um, file suit or think about, you know, those research or policy that having a partner in our city defenders has really helped to strengthen um, and, and more quickly give us access to the different ways in which power has been used against us, right? And having those tools on the side of the people, on the side of the marginalized, give us good standing to contest for that power long-term. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I'd love to speak in terms of power and to, to push others to think and speak in terms of power because it really is um, the critical construction when when we think about what is required for transformational change. Um, And one of the last year, and I've I've recommended now to folks many times that they read, maybe I read a couple years ago, um, Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is um, very useful to me precisely because 
um, he sort of presents in a very accessible way this relationship between ideas and policies and power and makes the point, which I think is exactly right, that we spend way too much time talking about individual sentiment, talking about people's ideas and what's in their heads. And we spend way too little time talking about the way that racist power operates, patriarchal power operates, capitalist power operates, and on and on. And that's really where we need to start the analysis, anchor the work upstream in an understanding of how power is operating, and then really seek to, to challenge that power. And for us, as a legal organization, um, as, as Kayla was sort of saying, we are we are uh, an anti-racist abolitionist legal organization that sits within the legal system, this, this site of so much um, power, sexist, classist, racist power, historically and presently. That has always been true in the law in the United States of America. And so what we are called to do um, fr from our standpoint as people that believe that structural transformational change is necessary is to utilize that access to shift power increasingly towards our clients, towards our organizing partners, toward the folk that we are in relationship with and to find creative ways to marshal our energies and our skill sets so that our folks can exercise some power in the systems that we have some access to. And so that's precisely what it is for us to bring class action lawsuits against various cities in the region who have jailed poor black people for years so that they can make money to, to fund their city budgets. That's, that is an exercise of power, shifting power into the hands of our clients and letting them actually take the fight to some of these cities. Or when we're suing um, police officers that have abused people's um, constitutional civil rights, that's another exercise in just pushing back against the ways that racist power tends to operate in these settings. Um, and I think that uh, any sort of work happening without that kind of power analysis is ultimately serving um, to preserve and perpetuate the system. Even if in, in you know, small doses, you are helping someone that day to meet some, some minor material need, which is important. We do that too. We do direct service work too. If it's absent of power analysis, if it's not tied in some way to an, to an effort to shift power, then it's really not gonna get us to the kind of structural and transformational change that we need. Yes, I agree. Hmm. Hmm. A, lot of, a lot of food for thought. Thank you uh, both uh, Kayla and Blake. Um, this is a really, uh, I'm so glad that you guys brought that out because it's easy to miss, but it's a really important aspect that puts your work into perspective. And so uh, I thank you for bringing that out. Um, you know, um, we're going to shift, and I hope there is going to be a point in this Q&A because um, uh, um, uh, I, I, I feel sort of remiss because I wanted to ask Kayla specifically about, uh, you know, her journey at Wash U. Um, okay. uh, <laughs> I, 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 you can, uh, well, well, Kayla, let me say, can, can you give us a really brief, uh, yeah, sure. uh, before we go into the, the Q&A and tell sure. us, you know. My experience. Yeah. yeah, is, is Professor <laughs> Rosenfeld on here? I hope not. But um, <laughs> what I will say, no, what I will say is that I, you know, it is, it is both. I did not graduate. I did not go the traditional route of school. I came back to school and started Wash U, really as a sophomore um, at twenty six, um, and so I was always the oldest person in my classroom. But what I understood differently than when I was eighteen is what I wanted to learn. And so I, I understood that I wanted to organize it. I, would, I had these ideas of, of, of what it meant to shift power and transform systems. And so the sociology department and African-American studies department, African and African-American studies department in Washington really created a pathway for me to curate an experience that I got to automatically apply to the work that I was doing, right? So I was taking a class about race and gender as we were thinking about the Black Mamas Day bailouts, right? And we were able to think about um, inequality, right? The, the sociology department at WashU really focuses on how to tell the story of inequality, not as happenstance, right? But as both um, a structural policy-driven um, predicament that, that we can also use those tools to kind of undo and, and restore power to people. Um, and and, and it, it was, I was a sponge, right? I was, I was a deep sponge. And so even the way that we arrived at housing as an issue area in action is in part because of our deep relationship with Arch City and in part informed by the folks that we have been working with around Close the Workhouse who kept coming out of jail to not having stable housing. 
But also I understood that one of the main ways that we understand the fragmentation of our region, the inequality of our region, um, the wealth disparities in our region is around how housing was organized, right? That Shelley V. Kramer just doesn't happen in St. Louis. It's the place where housing was being like organized to create and enforce segregation and class disparities. And so I learned so much in my experience at WashU and, and like am an ambassador for people to, if you don't major in sociology, you at least need to go to room 213 on uh, in uh, Siegel Hall to sit in that room and take some of those some, some of those courses with some of the, the most amazing professors I think are, are at WashU. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that it really helped to kind of create, even at Action right now, we believe in political study. And so one of the books we just finished reading and the two books that are like right next to my desk are The Broken Heart of America by Walter Johnson. And the next book I plan to read is like The Grassroots at the Gateway by Clarence Lang. Both are like sociological books and frameworks to think about how race and class are organized, even how social movements respond to inequality. Um, and, and I just think it was it was a really great experience at the right time for me to think about the work that I wanted to do long term. And I hope that that is a pitch for any of the students who are listening here to just make sure you take at least one sociology class while you're at WashU. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Kayla. Uh, so I think that's a great pivot point, actually, to uh, to end the Q and A. Um, and so I'll start with a question. You know, Kayla and Blake have given us a lot to to uh, to think about today, and uh, so we're going to use the, the remaining uh, minutes today uh, for uh, questions. Um, I'll start with a question that a lot of people ask uh, through the registration, and I'll work my way through the other questions, which is, you know, what can uh, what can people viewing, uh, tuning into um, our event today, what can they do? So there's a broad question here, which is wh what role can WashU and its alumni play in the kind of work that you do? There's a more specific question also about what kinds of resources are, you know, can people sort of um, uh, consult and what specific things can they sort of um, look into um, uh, as ways of contributing to this kind of work. And so I'm going to throw that out there to both of you, uh, to either or both of you. Um, and then after that, I'll, I'll dig into some of the other um, possibly more specific questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, so as we're talking about power and collaboration and the way our organizations have worked together, um, one thing that that's a reflection of is the, the importance of organized community, you know, part of the way we begin to shift power is by people coming together um, and finding common interest and working together around a common goal and certain political commitments. Um, that, that literally is the work of people like Kayla who are organizers and helping to build power at the grassroots level. And that requires plugging in, that requires people from various walks of life, um, finding organizations like Action St. Louis. Um, and there are many, many others to, get a, a kind of snapshot of some of what that looks like in St. Louis. Um, we just launched this project called the People's Plan, S People's Plan STL. Um, the link is peoplesplanstl.org, which is really focused on policy transformation in the city of St. Louis. But in terms of identifying organizations, anchor organizations that are doing work around these four pillars that we've named Making St. Louis Home, funding our future, building inclusive democracy and re-envisioning public safety. Each one of those has a bunch of anchor organizations doing really tremendous grassroots work, has campaigns that you can become a member of, support, volunteer, plug into, and has community resources. So readings, videos, audio, um, you know, Kayla plugged the podcast. There are just endless resources. Um, and that's one great place to find a lot of those in St. Louis, because many of the folks that are doing this work on the ground are actually in relationship in ways that you don't always see. And that's one of the things that I think is reflected around the, the people's plan. So I would certainly, um, certainly suggest that. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't also say resources really matter. So give money to these places and give money to black led organizations that are doing work there, aren't you? <laughs> well, you know, I like to people know you're going to say that. So I'd like to say the other thing first, but but that does matter. And, and each of our organizations um, depends on that for for our operations. So those are those are two concrete things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I only I would I would uh, add, you know, lend your expertise expertise. Wow, so many tongue twists tonight. Uh, give your time, right, and, and share your resources. I think that those are kind of the ways that I think about folks being able to contribute in this moment. There are so many organizations 
in our region that do phenomenal work, whether it's Arch City Defenders, which is my absolute favorite organization uh, in our region, even though I'm not, not biased. I'm not biased. <laughs> um, but there are also other groups like, you know, Jobs with Justice and NARAL and Metro Congregations United. So from your vantage point, there is a way to enter into this work, um, whether, you know, and, and, and anchor yourself in this current work. Uh, and the reason we named our organization Action, right, is because it is, a, it is simply that, take action. Um, whether it's, you know, speaking truth to power from your platform, sharing resources with other folks. Sometimes it's having that argument at your dinner table whenever we can sit at dinner tables again together. Um, it's, it's combating the kind of the ways in which narratives have become um, fact, right? And, and propaganda has become fact and, and really dismantling that in our most immediate circles and then thinking about the, the broader ways that we can create uh, we can create impact. And I see a question from Professor Hayward. And I just want to say, if you are a student here at WashU right now, you should take every class that she offers because it was really like, I just had re a really good experience. And so you should go see her. She's, a, she's my favorite professor in the political science department. I'm just plugging everything everybody <laughs> all right thank you yes and i and i second take uh professor hayward's class i second that um uh can i um uh let me just um uh voice a question from blake hamilton uh blake asks is it it is clear that power analysis needs to be a critical component of the work of nonprofits? um but this work is often done at a leadership level by a few employees how can organizations begin to engage in power analysis in direct service? And, I, and I'll throw that out mm. either to, to either of you. Sure. You want me to answer first? Um, I'll, yeah, answer, go ahead. I'll answer okay. very quickly and then I'll ask <laughs> because you because Arch City does way more direct service than action does. I think one of the most immediate ways is connecting to organizations that do organizing work. And so someone may come in for an immediate need, but you can you can connect them to long term work. I think about this a lot in the work that we do around housing. I'm going to plug this, John. Watch it. You come in for rental assistance, <laughs> connect them to the tenant organizing, like the petition that was dropped by Sarah in the chat around the organizing that's happening to get St. Louis City to pass a tenant bill of rights. And so someone has an immediate need, but there's a long term structural change that they need to get involved in that actually could help them longer term. And so, you know, there's an organizing side to every part of the kind of mutual aid or like uh, service based work that is happening and those organizations exist. So I would encourage folks who are in more of the direct service type of organization and nonprofit to think about what are the organizing organizations or the advocacy organizations that connect to the type of services you provide and create a streamline for those organizations to have access to those to those folks who are clients for you and will be base members for them. Uh, so first of all, I have to say, even though I didn't go to Wash U, I know someone here too. Blake Hamilton was in my leadership St. Louis class, has done amazing work at International Institute. So I know he knows a thing or two about this. Hi, Blake. I think this is a very, very important and actually very hard question. Um, because one of the things that we know is that uh, service organizations, direct service organizations have in all sorts of ways been complicit in all manner of structural abuses that have taken place um, over many years. And in, in some ways, the service organizations themselves become the thing that maintains the system by giving some sort of release valve to say that we actually are helping people at the margins. And so it's even more important to me for those who are in this, this direct service field to think critically about interventions that can be made that disrupt the status quo. And I think Kayla named one, which is simply, if it's not something you do, then get in relationship with someone who actually does that kind of power shifting work and get in relationship programmatically. So move people from one space into another space. And that that's always doable. That doesn't have to happen at the leadership level. That can happen throughout an organization. Um, I also think it's just really important. And I'm sort of stealing here from um, a, a lawyer named um, Chase Strangio at the ACLU, uh, who I heard say, you know, we are all making trade-offs all the time. Um, all of us are like a little bit compromised by virtue of, of living 
in this world um, and trying to survive ourselves. We're all a little bit compromised. And that's certainly true if you're doing various types of direct service work. But one of the things that you can do is make visible the kind of invisible trade-offs that are happening. Um, we don't have to pretend that these are perfect systems. We don't have to pretend that there aren't harms being done in the ways that we try to intervene to help people. But we can at least name what those harms are. We can at least name what the trade-offs are and then both let people make more informed decisions about it and let the, the, the folks that have sort of set these systems up, the people that might be the bosses, the people are at the head of the organizations, um, to make sure that they can't say they weren't aware that these, these trade-offs are happening. They weren't aware these harms are occurring. Um, so I think some of this is just about speaking truth to power at all times um, and being able to, to, to act as an honest broker, even if you are acting within a, um, a somewhat compromised and imperfect system. Thank you both. And what, an, uh, what a great practical insight. You know, we're compromised through and through, unfortunately, but we can be intentional about talking about what the trade-offs are and we can have a conversation, we can be accountable around that. Um, and I think that's a, I think that's a really important practical insight. Let me um, ask, um, uh, shift to some more specific questions. Um, I think it, it, we have a, a bit of time to just ask some more specific questions, questions I think both of you can speak to. Um, and this question is from Ellen, Ellen Barker. Um, are St. Louis City and County moving toward eliminating cash bail as few other um, municipalities are. And so this is a general question of where are we at on cash bail, this, um, this really important issue for, for both of you. And I'll throw another, um, uh, uh, no, let's, let's, let's just go with that. Okay. Um, so we are not like, for example, the state of Illinois, which just passed uh, a law um, abolishing cash bail in the state. There's no such legislation in the state of Missouri or on the local level. There have been uh, significant changes around bail and pretrial detention. Those have been very hard fought. They have come in lots of different forms, including um, our elected prosecutors in city and county that have taken um, a different stance. Neither of them have, have um, walked away from bail outright, but have taken a, a different stance than their predecessors around um, requesting bail on cases and setting some standards to try to reduce the number of cases where they're re requesting bail. Um, and in beginning of 2019, January 2019, Arch City Defenders um, with, with three different co-counsel filed a class action lawsuit against the city of St. Louis and the court, the 22nd Judicial Court, um, which is the circuit in the city of St. Louis about their bail practices. And so we've been in a sort of give and take and changing um, context around bail in the city in large part because of that litigation, because of some rule changes on the state level. The Missouri Supreme Court um, issued new bail rules that require uh, courts to provide certain constitutionally mandated procedural and substantive protections. And so um, there's lots of stuff happening around bail. If you look just just looking at the city of St. Louis, for example, there are far fewer people today that are getting cash bail than were a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, it's also true that there are a lot more people getting no bond, so being preventatively detained without getting any bail at all. Um, and so we still have a huge pretrial detention problem in this uh, region. And I do encourage people to think about pretrial detention as being um, the frame as opposed to bail. Bail is a particular tool that has been used um, to, to monetize pretrial detention and to make it possible for wealthy folks to get out when poor folks have to sit. Um, but there are other forms of pretrial detention and pretrial infringements on liberty that, that are not just cash bail. So uh, a very complicated picture, probably a longer answer than you were bargaining for, but um, there it is. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more. And so, um, you know, maybe I'll stay on this um, on this topic of bail. Um, Blake, you, you may have just answered this question or, or part of it, but I'll say it anyway. It's about an alternative to bail, um, considering that racial bias can affect, and, and this question is from Tyler Cargill. Um, and uh, Tyler asks about racial bias and how it affects um, how a judge determines a bail amount. Uh, and considers how uh, and, and how criminally accused people have different capabilities of paying bail. 
what might be an alternative to bail that avoids these pitfalls altogether? Again, maybe you spoke to some of that before, but I wanted to ask both of you if you had any um, uh, ideas about that. And, and uh, uh, really briefly, because we only have about two minutes. Yeah, I can answer my, I can give my answer pretty quickly. Go uh, for it. I think the pretrial, I think the pretrial system in this country needs to be abolished. People should not be held in cages um, when they have not been convicted of a crime. Um, that is, that's it on my, on my perspective. Blake. Yeah. The alternative is home. That's what we said when we, when we launched the Close the Workhouse campaign. Where are they going to go? We said home. <laughs> that's where they're going to go. Everything. Okay. Which people okay, and let, me, and let me just uh, cut in one. Let me ask you guys one more question, okay? Uh, just yeah. question. What are your hopes for St. Louis um, or in the challenges of the current moment? What gives you hope? And, and again, I have to actually be very brief. I mean, this is a really big question. For sure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say that right now, St. Louis is at a fork in the road, right? That we have the opportunity to usher in um, the type of leadership um, and the type of possibility that transforms this region, or we can double down on more of the same that has created these outcomes that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think that we have a very um, aware and awakened uh, electorate and, and just base of everyday people who understand the systems in part because of the work our organizations are doing. And our hope is to continue to mobilize them. I think we need to repair some of the harms that have been caused across history. We need to invest into the communities that have been been, uh, neglected both, you know, like systematically over the last century. Uh, and we need to do that in an equitable way. And so our, my hope is that people understand that every time they go to the ballot, every decision that they make around who they support, it is a, it is a question about which kind of St. Louis do you want uh, to build one that is transformed and centers the most impacted or one that leaves them behind. Uh, and I will say 30 seconds, working with brilliant people like Kayla gives me hope. Um, seeing a project like the, the People's Plan and the, the groundswell of support and the you know, now probably close to 40 organizations that have thrown their weight behind it, um, that sort of uh, collective vision gives me hope. And then seeing our clients, um, the moments when, when I get to watch our clients go from barely surviving on the margins to finding some stability to joining campaigns and leveraging their own, raising their own voices and becoming leaders, that gives me more hope than anything. Thank you too so much. I hope everyone can join me in sort of giving you a virtual round of applause. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for participating in our event. I wanna just say to everyone in the audience, we, we look forward to seeing you all again for future programs and encourage you to be engaged in your communities. Stay tuned for upcoming events from the WashU Alumni Association and the Black Alumni Council. Thank you guys so much and have a great rest of the night.